So we must all reach the state of enlightenment. And in order to do this, we need to build up our two accumulations. Without amassing the accumulations, there is no such thing as obtaining the state of enlightenment. Therefore, we should take every opportunity to build up these accumulations. We say that we are Buddhist, and therefore these um, objectives are very important for us. Now, unfortunately, we're all very busy, so we cannot say that I'm going to dedicate, like my prime activity is to build up the accumulations of merit. We all have to go to work. We all have to, we are busy with many activities. We have responsibilities. We have to raise up children, uh, take care of the family and so forth. So it's not going to be our main activity. However, we should take every opportunity on the side as a supplementary activity to build up the two accumulations. So this is the reason we are going to recite. We start the classes by reciting the verse for refuge and bodhicitta, and then the Gandhantla Gemma. Now, as I say, we're all interested in practicing something, but in terms of practices, the Dharma that you can practice can be non-Buddhist or it can be Buddhist. For your practice to become Buddhist, first of all, you must take refuge. You must go for refuge. But um, going for refuge, of course, guarantees that the activity or the practice becomes a Buddhist practice but in addition to that we want to make sure that our practice is a Mahayana practice and to be a Mahayana practice it must be influenced by bodhicitta therefore to establish both of this refuge and the mind of bodhicitta we recite the verse which includes refuge and bodhicitta so the verse begins by saying i go for refuge until i'm enlightened to the buddha the dharma and the supreme assembly these two lines are the lines of refuge and then it continues by saying through the the accumulations that that i amass by practicing generosity and the other perfections may i reach the state of buddhahood to benefit all sentient beings. So this is the lines for bodhicitta. So by combining these two, we uh, go for refuge and bodhicitta. Okay, so we have started here with a presentation of the main colors. And uh, it uh, might be the case that when you come to this class, there are some things that you do not understand. However, do not think that this class is of no benefit. Do not think that there's no benefit coming and attending. Just, just listening to this information places imprints in your mind. These are the imprints that are created through listening. And eventually, with time, those imprints will be activated. And when we say the imprints will be activated, it means you will find that you will develop understanding on those things that you previously heard but didn't understand back then. So by placing the, the imprints of listening, it can only become better. You can only improve, right? So it's important that we come and we listen. Okay, so we have talked about the colors, all right, and the thing is that there is uh, some presentation that follows after the color that calculates the possibility. So we want to see three possibilities or four possibilities with the colors and so forth. Okay, before we got into that, Geshe I would like to start with the presentation of shapes. The reason for that is that what our eyes perceive is two things. We see color and we see shapes, okay? So this I would like to introduce shapes here. And once we have the shapes, we're going to go and look at the possibilities, the three possibilities, four possibilities. If you can calculate the possibilities, if you can understand this, you will see that it helps a lot in understanding when you have privation, when you don't have privation and so forth. So it's very useful. Okay, so we say from amongst the two things that our eyes, eyes can see, the colors and the shapes, so we're going to give now the definition of the shape. So shape is that which is suitable to be a, a shape, or you can say suitable to be an outline, if you want. So previously with the colors, we said it is that which is suitable to be a hue. So now we say that 
which is suitable to be a, a shape. And that means that which is suitable to indicate a shape to our eyes. Okay, when we give the definition and an object defined, usually together with that, we give an example. Technically, the term is a basis of illustration. A basis of illustration is something which is, um, which is going to illustrate, act as an example to show what we are talking about. And in this case, you could say that all, uh, let's say, 3D objects, but also I would say 2D objects as well, um, such as like a vase or a pillar, they are bases of illustration. They are examples that illustrate that. Anyway, it will become clear rare as we go along. Okay, so if we classify shapes, we are given a list of eight types of shapes. So we have shapes that are long, shapes that are short, those that are high, those that are low, those that are square, those that are round, those that are regular, and those that are irregular okay actually with the shapes we are surrounded by objects that um, demonstrate these types of shapes so they are quite easy to understand so the first one is a long shape so something which is long something elongated for example you could say that this the street is long or you could say for example the string a piece of string is long or you could say that a river runs for a long distance, is a long river, and so forth. The opposite of that is something which is short. So short meaning, you know, it's not long, it's quite short. Okay, the next one is high. So high here indicates that you're going up, you gain some height, and therefore you have high. And then the opposite of that is low. Okay, uh, the next one, or you could say it's short, yeah, the next one is square. Square here indicates something that has four sides. Okay. The next one is the round. Okay. So the round here is to be understood as something globular. So imagine something like a sphere, for example, but also a cylinder. Yeah. So you have a cylinder. It is round, but it is more, it's a tall round thing. Okay. So in the round, we have two understandings. Then we have the regular and the irregular. Regular here indicates that you have all the parts complete. So for example, if you have a vase and all the parts of the vase are there, the vase is not broken, is not damaged, right? So you have a regular complete shape. So the opposite of that, if there are parts parts that are missing they are broken or you know it has you know if it hits something and let's say you know the round part has caved in you know it has been um uh, how do you say this uh, mis uh, mishandled right okay so all of this indicates irregular shape Okay, another uh, interpretation or another understanding of the terms regular and irregular shape is that regular refers to an even surface. So even here, it means like, you know, something like that is flat, is not creased. Okay, so that is a regular, flat, even surface. And the irregular is an uneven surface that is restricted or pinched, right, confined. Okay, so that's another interpretation of the terms regular and irregular. Okay, so we want to come in here, basis illustrating this, in other words, examples. So for the first one, we have the long shape. So if you want to give an example, many people ask, what is the longest? shape that I could have, the long, giving the example of the longest uh, thing. Obviously, different people would give different answers here. Some, for example, say that um, a river is the longest. Other people would say that a road, a street is the longest. Okay, so different people give different answers.
Mm. Okay, so um, Geshe is asking you, which one would you say is the longest? Are you going to say, for example, is it the water in the river? Is it um, a road? Are you going to posit something else? What do you think? Great Wall of China. Sorry? The Great Wall of China. Well, yes, but the Great Wall of China is only found in China, whilst you have water that flows from countries before it reaches China, it even comes to China, and then it keeps going. So you could say there is water that is longer, it runs for longer than the Great Wall. All right, so I guess I was saying, of course, you know, if I, if you ask uh, different people, you know, there will be many answers as to what is the longest. But when we were debating or studying this material in the monastery, the, the answer was that the longest that you can find is the hair treasure uh, between the eyebrows of Buddha Shakyamuni, because when you pull that hair treasure out, you can pull it for, uh, it, it's almost like endless. So it's the longest thing. It can go around the earth many times and it is still um, length remaining. So I guess I was saying, uh, that's the longest example we can come up with. Of course, whether you know it's in accordance with reality, whether it's real or not, cannot say. Okay, so if the Tibetans, all right, so this is cultural, you have to understand. They say, okay, when, when they ask what is the shortest, they say it is the eggs of lice. You know how you can get lice in your head or even in your clothes? And they have like little eggs, they put little eggs. So those eggs of the lice or the nits, you know, the little ones that come out of there are the shortest. Okay, so that's the Tibetan example. What's your example of the shortest? Okay, so um, again, the answer is that this the shortest, the example of the shortest is an atom. Okay, so an atom is a very small particle that you cannot perceive with your eyes. You need to rely on a microscope in order to, to see it. And it is something that cannot be further divided. So you cannot find the sides, the four sides, right? So you can talk about the atom of earth, an atom of water, an atom of fire, and so forth. So... Uh, it is interesting because uh, there is doubt whether you can posit the atom, one atom, as being form or not. If something is, is form, then it must be suitable to be form. So suitable to be form means suitable to indicate form. So suitable to indicate form means that suitable to be seen by your eyes as form. But since here we're talking about something which is so small that your eyes cannot see and you have to rely on the microscope to see it, there is doubt whether the atom uh, or those tiny particles um, should be posited as form or not. Anyway, they're given us the example of the shortest thing. So I guess I was saying still, you know, we an atom is something that our eyes can see by using the microscope, the lens of the microscope, isn't it? So you know, at the one end of the, of the microscope, you have the atom. On the other end, you have your eyes. And your eyes can see it by relying on the microscope, right? So perhaps we can accept it. It is seen by the eye, in parenthesis, through the microscope. Because if we don't accept this as being seen by the eye, then, you know, all of us <laughs> have to wear glasses. Like for... for for Geshe-la, for myself, you know, to see different forms around me, I have to wear my glasses, isn't it? So the my eye sees the forms by relying on the glasses, but we accept this. We have no problem accepting this. So perhaps we should accept the microscope also, whatever the tiny things seen in the eye through the microscope. Okay. Okay, so now once we start saying that we rely on the glasses, to see different objects. 
you can get tinted glasses. So the glass themselves might be yellow or green or black. All right. So then actually that affects the, the color of the object that you see. It, gives it makes it yellowish or green or black. So now there is to be investigated uh, whether you see correctly in this way. You see the object. So, for example, if you put in blue glasses, blue tinted glasses, and you look at the snow, you sh the snow is white. So when we say I see snow, we should be able to see it white. But if you're wearing the glasses, the blue glasses, and you see the snow in a different color, bluish color, you don't actually see the correct object. Isn't it? And the same thing for the yellow, the green, the black glasses, and so forth. Okay. So I guess I was saying, yes, this is uh, an issue to take into consideration that you don't see the right object or the object that you see does not really exist. So we talked about the long and the short. Okay. So I guess I was holding his... Uh, oops. Where is it? Okay, Gesha was holding a, a book, a notebook in front of him, right? And he was saying, if you look at the spine of this book, all right, you can say it is long because there is another notebook. You can find a notebook that is shorter than this one. And therefore, in comparison to that which is shorter, you can say that this one is long. Okay, but if you compare the same notebook to a notebook that is bigger, longer, right? Then you can say this notebook is short in comparison to the other one, which is longer. But in this way, there is the danger that the same object, the same notebook becomes long and short. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as you can see here, we ended up with a notebook, but at the same time, it is long and it is short. Therefore, in one object, you can find both the qualities of long and short. So then you could say, oh, therefore, long and short are not contradictory because I can find them in the same object, isn't it? So that's the danger with that. Another example to consider is meat momos. Those who like meat will say meat momos are very good. Meat <laughs> momos are delicious. There are those who don't like meat momos and say meat momos are not good. You know, they rise your blood pressure, they bring disease. It's not good at all to eat meat momos. So here we have one object, the meat momo. Uh, you can say I have 100,000 people who say they're very good. I have an equal number, 100,000 of people who say, no, it is not good, it's bad. So one object, again, at the same time is good and bad. So that is problematic, right? Because usually these two things are opposites. But here we say good and bad exist in the mid momo. So the thing to keep in mind here is that all phenomena are posited through the process of uh, interdependence. The process of dependent origination it means Every phenomenon is posited in comparison to something else, in relation to something else, by depending on something else, isn't it? There is no entity, there is no phenomenon that is posited without depending on something else. So this actually, to, to think about that is quite beneficial. It helps us understand a bit dependent origination, interdependence. All right, so we understood a little bit about the shapes. So we're going to go back to what we say to look at colors and see whether there are three possibilities, there are four possibilities, and so forth. It's very important to calculate the possibilities. And in, but to do this, you have to have two objects. So you have to bring in two colors. And once you bring two colors, you want to examine and you say, are there three possibilities between these colors? Are there four possibilities between these two colors? Are those things uh, opposites or contradictory? Or are those things 
are the same. Okay, so here we want to, we have four questions. Is it three possibilities, four possibilities, contradictory, or the same? Okay, before we started doing this, right, comparing two different colors, two different objects, it's very good to understand what does it mean to have a possibility? So we say we have to cal calculate, is it three possibilities, is it four? Let's try to calculate this on one basis like on one object before we start comparing two. So first of all, the, the word that we translate here in English as possibility in Tibetan is mu. And mu is the word that is used to, uh, it's like the border between two fields, right? So one person has a plot and the other farmer has another plot. And in between these fields, these plots, there is a mu. And mu here indicates a delineation, a border, because the border will make you decide, are you going to go this way or are you going to go that way? Okay, so this is the etymology in Tibetan. So it's the border, the delineation. Okay, so uh, we're looking at one basis, meaning just one ob ob object. All right, and we want to see whether it is whether it is both. So obviously we're looking at some qualities, whether it is one but not the other, or whether it is the other but not the first. Okay, whether it is the first but not the second, or the second but not the first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know when we say that you have um, two fields, right? You have two plots, and in between you have the moon or you have the border. Okay, so that border there is a common border. So it's a border for this field, but also it is a border for that field, isn't it? Because it's in between the two, okay? So this is how we can say that you can have something which is both because this is the border for this and the border for that. Okay, now there are other cases where you can say, no, no, this is only the border for this. So this is how uh, like the possibilities are calculated. Okay, now we say that we are looking at whether there are three possibilities or four possibilities. And then we mention whether they are contradictory or whether they are the same. So before you are able to give any of these answers, you must understand what does it mean to be same and what does it mean to be contradictory. So Geshe, I would like to explain this. All right, so let's understand what it means to be the same. Uh, literally, it is translated as same meaning or same object, so the same. Okay, so here we are comparing two bases, two things, all right, and we say, if you can find a common basis, now common basis means something which is both. And in addition to that, if you have the eight doors of privation. So last week we did those eight doors of privation, isn't it? So if you have both of those things, then you can say that these things are the same. Okay, so when we uh, used, when we explain the eight doors of privation, we say you can talk about eight doors of privation and you can say about the eight doors of privation mutually for each other. So we're not saying mutually for each other, just the eight doors of privation. Okay, so let's give an example here of um, two things that have the same meaning or they are the same. Okay, they refer to the same thing. Okay, you know, for the moon, we have different names, alternative names. All right. So one of the names of the moons is um, the, the one having white light. And another name, again, we use for the moon, is the one that has cooling light. So we're looking at two, the, two, this, these two names, possessing white light, possessing cooling, cooling light. So first of all, we want to say that actually the eight doors of pervasion 
are all present here. If it is white light, it is cooling light. If it is cooling light, it is white light. If it is not white light, possessing white light, it is not possessing cooling light. If it is not possessing cooling light, it is not possessing white light. And if it is, uh, if it exists as white light, it exists as cooling light, if it does not exist as white light, it does not exist as cooling light, and so forth. So we'll calculate the eight doors of pervasion. Okay, so we tick this one. The other thing that must be in place is that we must find a common basis, meaning something which is both. So an example of that is, look at the moon. Is the moon possessing white light? And it is the one that is possessing cooling light. Okay, so it fulfills all the criteria. So we can say that possessing white light and possessing cooling light uh, are the same meaning. Mm. Okay, so let's look at the other possibility, which is to be opposite, so contradictory. Okay, for things to be contradictory or opposites, first of all, they must be different. And in addition to be different, it must be impossible to find something which is both, a common basis. Okay, to give you an example, right hand and left hand. Right hand is different from the left hand. Left hand is different from the right hand, isn't it? These two are different things. And it is possible to find something that is both right and left hand, isn't it? So therefore, we say these two are opposites. They are contradictory. Oh, you twist your arm and it becomes <laughs> left hand, right? <laughs> No, it doesn't matter how much you twist it and you turn it. Your left hand will always be the left hand and the right hand will always be the right hand and you cannot find something which is both the right and the left hand. Okay, and even you might be thinking, if I cross my hands over, right, so I take my right hand and I bring it over in the left side, and I take the left hand and I bring it over to the right side, still, it is my right hand, all right? So it will always be my right hand, even if it is over there on the left side, okay? Mm. Mm. All right, so uh, let's go here to see what it means to have three possibilities, okay? So we're going to compare two things. One is color. The other one is white color. And we want to see how many possibilities are there. And we said there are three possibilities. The first possibility is something which is both. Something which is both means something which is white color and it is color, all right? So for example, a white religious conch it is we have color and it is white color so we have something which is both okay in this we have at least one possibility then we want to look at the second possibility the second possibility is calculated by seeing who pervades what and who does not pervade what okay so we say that if something is white color, it is pervasive that it is color, okay? So the white color pervades color. But if it is color, it is not pervasive that it is white color. Therefore, the color does not, there's, we miss the pervasion there. All right. So by calculating who pervades whom and who does not pervade whom, uh, we end up with an example of something, for example, the red color. The red color is color, but it is not white color, isn't it? Okay. And now we come to the third possibility. So we see the possibility of being both. 
We've seen the second possibility that comes from calculating who pervades whom, who does not pervade whom. And the third one is something which is neither, something which is neither a color nor the white color. Okay, so you can give many examples here, like the vase, the pillar, something irrelevant to color. Okay, so we have three possibilities. So we have seen how we cal calculate the three possibilities. Then we want to see how we, hopefully you understand that, of the three possibilities, are they clear? All right. Then we want to see how we calculate the four possibilities. When calculating the four possibilities, it is a little bit different. Okay. So now we're going to look at two objects. One is the color of wood and the other one is a root color so we have one possibility of something which is both all right so what is it something which is both white wood so it is the color of the wood and also it is a root color because it is white okay we have something which um, can be the color of the wood but is not a root color. So, for example, black wood. It is the color of the wood, but black, we know it's not a root color. Okay. We have something which is a root color, but is not the color of the wood. For example, the white conch, because it is white, it's a root color, but it is the color of the conch, is not the color of the wood. Okay. And then we have something with, we have things that are neither. And here you can give examples, for example, the, again, the vase, the pillar, many things. Okay. So I guess I was saying, okay, let's look now at the example of trying to calculate how many possibilities are between color and white. We want to first of all see if we can have, find something that is both, something which is color and it is white. Tell me. Do it. Is there a common? Kabo Kurongare, Kado Roa. Kabo Roa. Okay, the white itself isn't the white color. White is a color. And it's white as well, isn't it? Can you find something that is not it? So, for example, the color of a white flower. It is white and it is color, isn't it? It's both. Okay, so you can see we have a lot here. You could also say the color of white wood. Okay, so uh, the color of the white wood, it is white and also it is a color. And there are many things that are not it. For example, the color of a white house. It is white and also it is color, isn't it? Okay. So usually, you know, the traditional answer is the color of the white snow mountain. Okay. You can oh. say both mm -hmm. because it's, it is white and also it is a color. So oh. we found oh. that which is both. So now we have to calculate who pervades whom and who does not. Hmm. Now, previously, when we gave the example, we were working with color and white color, isn't it? And when we came to calculating the second possibility, we want to see who pervades whom. And we say, if it is a white color, it is pervasive that it is color. It is a color, always it's a color, isn't it? But when it is a color, it doesn't always have to be white color, right? So there's no pervasion. If it is a color, it doesn't have to be white color. So for example, it can be black color. Black color is a color, but it's not white color, isn't it? So there we, we calculated a possibility of something which, another possibility by calculating this, the pervasion. Mm. And that which is neither, you can say the vase. 
Okay, so in the case of the vase, the vase is not white and the vase is not a color, isn't it? So when we're dealing with a case like this, we say that we have three possibilities. Okay, so now let's ask you the question, how many possibilities here between color and yellow? All right, okay, so do you have, do we have the possibility of something which is both? Okay, so previously, didn't we have the example of color and white? And we went through explaining that white is a color and also it is white, isn't it? We talked about that. So now you substitute whether you're talking about yellow, whether you're talking about red, whatever it is. You have to consider these possibilities. It's crucial to find that which is both. No, you cannot say apple. You have to say the color of apple. Red color of apple. Yeah, yeah because they, they're green apples as well, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so we're dealing with uh, um, color and red. Okay, so can you find something which is both color and red? Okay, don't bring black into the discussion. We are trying to find something common, which is both color and red. Don't bring the black in this. Black. Oh, they were black lies. <laughs> okay. Sorry, that we, you were not talking about black. What are you talking about? Black. Task, it was a task. Oh, blood, blood. Okay, blood, blood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because when you say blood, if you just say blood, it could be plasma, which is white, or it could be the red cells, or you know, the white cells and the red cells of the blood. So you have to be more specific. Okay, so if you just say blood, it's not red, it's not red yet. Yeah, just blood is not red. <laughs> okay. And if you make this mistake in, deb in debate, it will be tsar. You finished and you should be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. And if you lose one, from that point onwards in the future, you will say the red color of blood. Okay. It will be, there are many people attending, and it's very good if each person thinks of their own example. Everybody think of something red. Okay, so let's see here. We're going to ask around the class. We want different answers. Something which is both red and color. The red color of China knot. Okay. Okay, Geshe's monk. The red color of Geshe's monk. Oh, dig so you could take this as an example and say, look at this. It is red and it is color. Okay. But also, if you look around you in the Gompa, in that building, you will find many examples. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, someone got it. Yeah. The, the red color that, you know, you're useful. Okay. Everybody has to think of their own example. Okay, there are many, many examples. Look around you. You are counting just that. <laughs> Guess what? The more I say, you know, the more the, the room is filled with these examples. Guess your last um, read, Tonka. Okay, in your case, because you pointed the finger and you the finger and you said, Geshe's Tonka, right? So we understand you're talking about a tonka that is red. So, but to be precise, you have to say the color of the red tonka. Why? Because there are tonkas that are different color. They are like blue-green tonkas, isn't it? So you have to say the color of the red tonka. So Gesha was saying, look around you. There are so many things you could say. So Gesha was pointing and saying, you know, that color behind the tonka, this the color red behind the tanka. Or you could say the color of the red lights in the gompa. Or you could say the color of the red shoes, the color of the red hat. You even have red coffee in, in Singapore, the color of the red coffee, the color of a red fish, the color of a red dog, and so on. You know, this is a look around you, the many, many examples. 
So it's actually very good to try and do this because the more you do it, you come in with more and more, more, more examples. And the more examples you discover, the easier it is to quickly identify an example of that. Like at the beginning of the conversation, we just had one example and we were just holding into that example like we couldn't find another. And now we find so many. So that is a difference. Pay attention to this. It makes a difference. Okay, the other thing that we have, the next thing we have to calculate is the pervasion. Who pervades whom? Okay, so we say if it is red color, it is pervasive that it is color. But if it is color, it is not pervasive that it is red, right? Isn't it? There are many colors. There are colors, but are not red. Okay, examples. Can you give an example? of something which is color, but it's not red. Okay, so whatever, I didn't hear the example, but whatever it was, it's a it's correct answer because it is a color, but it is not red. Okay, so it's like this before. We have said that everything that is white, all of the white things, they are color, all right? But not everything that is color has to be white. So in other words, you ask the question, tell me, give me something that is a color, but it's not white. Do I have colors that are not white? Okay, so sorry, we keep alternating here between the white and the red sometimes. Anyway, let's say we are discussing the red. The, um, if you say not the red, I don't want to, don't talk to me about red color, right? Okay, so take away the red. But there are so many other colors left that are not red, but they're colors, isn't it? How many colors are there apart from red? All right, okay, let, let's put the colors aside. So let's look at another pair of things. Human and Singaporean human. Okay, all right. Do you, got in there, you? do you have something that is both? So when I say do you have something which is both, I want you to come up with an example of something which is a, a Singaporean human and also a human. Okay. <laughs> so Gisha says, all of you. And then at the end of the sentence, he says, most probably. So <laughs> most probably all of you here. <laughs> okay. So you, you are Singaporeans there, right? The people who are present there in the class. And you are humans, aren't you? So... We have this possibility of being both. Uh, you are a Singaporean person and you are a person, a human. <laughs> okay. All right. The next thing we have to calculate is the pervasion. Like who pervades what and what does not pervade the other? Okay. So if someone is a Singaporean human, it is pervasive. It is necessary that this person is a human. Isn't it? Okay. So Singaporean human pervades, always means necessarily is a human. But if someone is a human, it does not pervade that it has to be Singaporean human. Isn't it? There, I guess I was saying there is at least one example of someone who is human and is not Singaporean. Myself in this class. Actually, you will find many examples, right? Many possibilities of being human, but not being a Singaporean human. All right, many people in India, all of them. There are people in Germany, humans in Germany. There are humans in France and so forth, right? So there are many humans in different countries, different places that are not Singaporean humans. Many, many examples. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, now we have to find something which is neither. Something which is mean, neither means is not a Singaporean human and is not a human. So when you hear that, it's like stop looking among humans because we want to find something which is not a human, right? So stop thinking about mountains and um, stones and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, trees and what have you, something not human. Okay, another example. 
we want to see the possibilities between momo and food. Okay, so there are actually many types of momo, like you can have meat momo, vegetarian momo, like if we use the word dumplings, right, for the momos, like in Singapore, in Singapore, you have sweet momo, you have white momo, you have yellow momo, all of those things, they're momos or dumplings, and they're food. Did you find something which is both a momo and food? Okay, and also there are different types of momos in terms of their shape. There are some that are round. There are some that are like flat momos. They're all momos and they're food. All right, so if we want to calculate who pervades whom, what would you say? Okay, all right, so if it is momo, it is pervasive, but it is food. If it is food, it is not pervasive. But it is momo. It's not always momo, isn't it? <laughs> food. Okay, give give example. Something which is food, but it's not pervasive. It doesn't have to be momo. Okay, give us some. I'm giving you here a menu of uh, every item in the Tibetan menu. You should name a lot of Singaporean foods that you have. Laksa, <laughs> chicken rice. Okay, so what are we saying here? We're saying that these examples here, they are food. These things are eatable. They are food. All right, so by doing this, we actually come to understand what is the relationship between food and momo. Because we understand that not every type of food is momo. And there are many things that are food but are not momo. And we we'll come to, to, you know, sort of like identify all these examples of food, which is not momo. And so that is very beneficial because we understand different categories of things, right? So just as we do here between the example of food and momo, we can do it with color and white color. Okay, so I guess what he's saying, I'm going to tell you that there are three possibilities between color and yellow color. Okay, so I guess what I've told you already, there are three possibilities. You tell me what is both. Okay, so uh, someone gave the example here of the yellow banana, but we can come up with many examples other than these. For example, the color of a yellow piece of cloth. Uh, the color of a yellow hat, the color of a yellow um, shirt, you can have the color of yellow hair, isn't it? Blonde hair and so forth. <laughs> okay, so we identify something which is both. All right, let, let's not forget, what are the two things we're talking about? All right, so now the next one, who pervades whom? One pervades the other, the other does not pervade the, the first one. Okay, so who pervades whom here? Color and yellow. Okay, so if it is yellow, it is pervasive that it is color. But if it is color, it is not, it is not pervasive that it has to be yellow. So give me examples of that which is color, but it's not yellow. There should be many. Color of the green banana. Mm. <laughs> okay, let's hear something else. The color of a blue pen. All right, so just like this, if you look around, you will find many examples. Okay, let's go to the last one, which is the possibility of that, which is neither of those. So never forget what are the two things that we are comparing, because you have to come with an example of something which is neither of those. <laughs> yeah. Okay, something which is neither color. Not a yellow. Okay. Color so color. Color color. Color the color. Forget the color at all. It cannot be part of your answer because we say something which is neither color nor yellow. So forget about color. Okay. Well, forget about colors. And remember the first thing we see, we said our eyes perceive two things one is color and the other one is shape and if now i'm telling you forget about colors a safe area to go is shapes so you can say you know a ball or you know something square something tall 
and so forth. Okay. Uh, let's do one more. Okay. White color and root color. Okay. So we changed from the previous example because in the previous example we had color and then either the white, the red, the yellow, whatever. All right. But now we're talking about root color. So root color and white, white color. Okay. Uh, we have something which is both. Uh, okay, you shouldn't just say milk. You should say the color. Okay, so we say it's both. So what are the two things? Okay, um, so we have given an example of the color of white milk as something which is both a root color and white color. Can you give some other example other than this? The red color of red and <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, the white color envelope. Mm, white color of the envelope. Yes, this is good. All right, okay, good. Okay, all right. The second thing to calculate is who pervades whom. So on one side we have the white color, on the other side we have the root color. Who pervades? Which way is the pervasion? All right, so you have to give it a complete answer. So you have to say, uh, if it is white, it is pervasive, that is root color. But then you have to continue and you say, if it is root color, it's not pervasive, but it is white. So if you say there is no pervasion in this case, the second case, you must be thinking of something. Give me the example. In order to say that it is not pervasive if it is a root color that it has to be white, it means you have calculated a possibility. Give me the possibility of not that which is white, uh, which is root color, but it is, is not white color. Okay, remember, we had given you a list of the root colors. Take out the white, so the, left, the, the items that are left in the list are root colors, but they're not white. Okay, so initially you think, okay, I had a list of four root colors. I took away the white. It means I can say that I have those three remaining root colors. Okay, so initially you think three, three things. However, you can apply those three things into many objects. So, for example, if let's say we're talking about the blue, you can talk about the blue color of the cloth, the blue color of the hat, the blue color of uh, the wood that you have painted blue, and so on and so forth. So because you apply this, you can find many, many possibilities. So now you can find so many possibilities. Initially, you just thought three, which is a very small number. And the more you think about it, the more it expands. Mm. So it is actually very good to go through this process because when you calculate the possibilities, you understand the relationship between these two things. So you will be able to say it, it is pervasive or it is not pervasive, okay? So what gives you that clarity to be able to say it is pervasive, it's not pervasive, comes from calcul calculating the possibilities. And once you come to have this clarity and confidence with saying there is pervasion, there is no pervasion, it means that you can apply that logic to all this entity, all this, all this phenomena we want to discuss. And therefore, all those texts of logic, of definitions, and so forth, uh, you, now you can approach them. You can understand them. So it's very important. <laughs> okay. So Geshe says, I'm going to give you one last example. How many possibilities between white and black? Four possibilities. All right, if you say there are four possibilities, the first possibility you have to tell us is the possibility of something being both. Tell us, what is both? Panda. The color of a panda. And zebra. <laughs> so we have a different word for that. It is neither white nor black. It is ribbon or <laughs> it is mixed, mixed. They are like um, enemies, adversaries. 
right? There are the two ends of the spectrum. One is white, the other is black. Okay, so in this case, there are, you cannot find three possibilities, you cannot find four possibilities, because these two things are the other category that we mentioned at the beginning, which is the opposite, so the contradictory ones. And we say to be that, they have to be different, distinct, and it is not possible to find a common basis. Okay, so if it is white, it cannot be black. And if it is black, it cannot be white. We cannot find that which is both white and black. So from the four different types of relationship that we mentioned in the beginning is the third one, which was the opposites. They are opposites because they are different, they are distinct. One is white, the other one is black. And at the same time, we cannot find anything that is both. The white will not become black. The black will not become white. And you can see in America, they have so many racial problems. Uh, can, can I clarify? Uh, so black and white, there's only two possibilities. Uh, if, but, um, so it's either black or it's, the, it, it's either white. But I was thinking a uh, third possibility could be neither white or black. Like red color, it's neither, it's not white and it's not black. So isn't it supposed to be like three possibilities? Yeah. Okay. So Gisha was saying when we calculate the possibilities, uh, uh, you have to go in order. Okay. So whether we talked about three possibilities or four possibilities, the first thing we say is that we have to identify something which is both, right? If you cannot find number one in the list. Forget about three possibilities, forget about four possibilities. Then, since you calculate, you estimate that this is three possibilities, okay, the first one is find something which is both. The second one was a who pervades whom. You should be able to say that one is pervasive, that it is the other, but if it is the other, it's not pervasive to be one. Can you, did you come up with this or not? Okay, so what you're doing here is you're calculating each one separately um, to come up with three possibilities, but that's not how we calculate, that's not how we count. Mm. So when we talk about calculating the possibilities, the way that we, you know, we have to go through the process, but this, we say, first, tell me that which is both. So the reason why we say first is because this is what you have to say first. This is have to you have to find first, okay? Then you start saying, uh, you know, who pervades whom. First, tell me that which is both, okay? So Gishala says, I would like to stop here for today, but I would like you to think, go back and think about this. Calculate three possibilities, four possibilities, different relationships, and this is your homework. Uh, you go home and you think how many possibilities are between color and color of the wood, wood color. Okay, this is next week. Come back. Yeah, we stop here.